pleasure to be up here this morning, again, getting to teach with you. The last time I was up here was um, Leap Year Weekend, and I had said, I really hope I don't have to wait till the next Leap Year Weekend to do this. And I had so many kind words from so many of you, and we got about a hundred letters, and mom, thank you very much, because... <laughs> I know that took a lot of time. <laughs> so here I am again. And, um, <laughs> and we're starting a brand new series on prayer. And this is going to be an exciting series. I'm kicking it off. Dan's going to be back here. Pastor Dan will be back next week. And um, we'll be going through a few weeks of this. And it's going to be a really great series. As I was preparing for this, I started thinking of some of the cute things about prayer that have happened in my family. And when my oldest boy, Bo, who is 13 now, was about four years old, he was given this little trinket from his grandma. And she had told him how special it was to her. And he carried it around with him. And during that first day that he had it, he lost it. And he couldn't remember where he put it. And he came in very frantically and said, Mom, I can't find that thing that Grandma gave me. And we need to pray about that. I said, that's a really good idea, Bo. So we started praying right then that God would help him remember where he'd put it. And that as he retraced his steps, he would find it. Well, he tried all day long, bless his little heart. Every time that he was back where he'd been playing, he was looking. Well, he didn't find it. And that night when we got into bed and we were praying, he said, Mom, I want to pray again about finding that thing that Grandma gave me. And I said, that's a really good idea. He said, do you think a lot of people pray that God would help them find things? I said, oh, yeah, lots do. And that's really important that we should always pray. And we want people, God wants people to be praying for things. And he said, well, maybe we should get up really early then and get first in line. <laughs> and... And I said, well, yeah, that we have some teaching about prayer to do with Bo. <laughs> and then my other boy, Keenan, who just turned 11 recently, he has been asking me for years for a drum set. He puts it on every birthday list, every Christmas wish list. He prays about it, and he says, Mom, how come God doesn't give me drums? And I said, God must not want you to have drums. <laughs> and of course, on his 11th birthday, our worship pastor, Ronnie Higuera, finds a set of drums for Kenan. <laughs> so we have drums in our basement now. Like, I don't have enough issues with Ronnie. And now he's affectionately known by Kenan as Uncle Ronnie. <laughs> Prayer has this potential of being very distorted, obviously. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about here during this series. One of the big issues that we, or two big issues that we actually have with prayer, many of us were never taught how to pray. And the second issue is that we don't know the words to use. And so we don't pray. And that's very similar to the situation, like if we know someone who is sick or dying or has gone through a disaster in their lives, and because we don't know the words to say, we don't say anything. And many times that's exactly what happens in our prayer life. Because we don't feel we know the words, we just avoid having any kind of a prayer life. The problem with that is that God wants us to pray. It's evident that he wants us to pray. And so we need to learn how to pray, and we need to learn what to say when we're praying. And the way that we're going to do that is we are going to follow the leader. We're going to find somebody who did know how to pray, and that person is Jesus. Jesus was a prayer. And what was great is that we see all through Scripture times that Jesus prayed. We see him praying when his life got demanding. In the very first part of his ministry here on earth, 
Crowds started gathering around him. The demands on his life were incredible. People were coming for his help. People were coming expecting healing. And when his life got demanding, he retreated and went and prayed. We also see that Jesus spent time praying when there were big decisions to be made. The night before he chose who his 12 apostles would be, he spent the entire night in prayer. Now that in itself is a feat for me. I sit and think to be able to put that many hours into prayer is amazing. But he recognized before a big decision, it was important that he sacrificed and put that time into it. So we see him praying then. We also see him praying when he was disappointed, when John the Baptist was beheaded, when he was sad, when things had, had not gone, wrong, gone right for him, when he was having a difficult time, he prayed. We also see that he prayed when he was worried about his friends. In Luke 22, Jesus says to Peter, 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 Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you. Imagine knowing that Jesus was praying so the faith of his friend would not be lost or stolen away. How great to know that. We also see Jesus praying when he faced the ultimate challenge. For those of us who have seen the Passion of the Christ, we see him in the Garden of Gethsemane the evening before he was crucified, praying earnestly to his Father. He knew there was a huge task in front of him, and he knew what it was. And he still went, asking for strengthening, asking for guidance, even saying, boy, if there's any way you can accomplish this without it being this particular way, will you remove this way? But we see him in something that was so important in this time of ultimate challenge to him, where the words in Scripture, as was his custom. This wasn't something he just fell into occasionally. He was a prayer person all of the time. He sought out his Father in prayer all the time. Important part about Jesus' prayer life, and one of the reasons we're going to follow him, because Jesus got results when he prayed. The other day, Tad was telling me how he was returning some library books to the downtown library, and he came across this man in our community, and I don't know any other name for him but the Birdman. Do you know who I'm talking about? Some of you might. He just wears a jacket with bird seed in it all the time, and he throws seed out. There's always birds around him. And there are birds around him even when he's not throwing the seed because he has become known to the birds as the man with seed. And so he is somebody who gets results with what he does. When he throws the seed out, and there's always birds waiting for that to even happen. And when Tad was telling me about that, I thought, boy, you know, that is just, that's a great example of what Jesus is, is just like. His prayer got results. And we need to learn about how to get results just like that. There's scripture in Luke again, in Luke 9, where Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him up to the mountain to pray. And when he was praying, his face shone bright, his robes became white and glistening. And after he prayed, the three disciples heard God's voice saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Jesus' prayer got results. Imagine if we had a prayer life that was so powerful that our countenance changed when we prayed. That after we prayed, people said, wow, I heard the voice of God. His prayer life was one that got results. And that's why we're going to follow after him. And why is a productive prayer life so important? Because our primary purpose, the reason we are here, is to have a relationship with God and to experience Him in our lives. And the relationship and the way that Jesus experienced God was in communication and prayer with Him. And so we see over and over in the Scripture the one consistent method Jesus used in communication with His Father was prayer. And since that's what He used to build His relationship, that's what we should use to build our relationship with God. And so we follow the leader. This series that we're going to be going through here at the church is going to be using the model of the Lord's Prayer. 
And as I said, I'm starting it out this week. I'm giving you an introduction to prayer. I'll also give you a few bits of, of information about the Lord's Prayer as we, we get into it. But over the next few weeks, I will tell you, our prayer lives can be changed radically, powerfully, into a prayer life that produces great results, into a prayer life that changes our relationship that we have with God. And I'm excited to see this happen. One of the things that I have, have said we, we're going to learn about this series, these are my alliterations, so have fun with me. We're going to learn how to converse with the Creator, how to dialogue with the Deliverer, talk with the Teacher, and I threw this one in for Ronnie, jive with Jesus. <laughs> now on your outlines... If you would like to go with me, um, there's a purple outline that we've provided. On the front of that, we're going to go through five steps toward understanding the basics of prayer. Five steps. The first step of this is that we're going to turn from what prayer is not. We're going to turn from what prayer is not. What we're going to do during this study is we'll be using the version of the Lord's Prayer out of Matthew 6. And this first part of Matthew 6 that I'm going to read um, has to do with this. What, what prayer isn't? You can open your Bible and, and read with me. I'm starting at verse 5 in Matthew 6, or you can follow along on the screen. But it says, Jesus says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. This passage tells us some important issues to avoid when it comes to praying. First of all, there's a wrong way to pray. As it's pointed out here, out in the open prayer, hoping people will notice you, is the wrong, is the wrong way to pray. The idea behind this kind of prayer is that you're hoping to be heard, you're hoping to appear religious or holy or righteous because you have no problem praying out loud somewhere. But the scripture says if you do this, that's your reward. Right there, what is seen by men. Because God recognizes this as falseness, as attention-seeking, and as pretense. He views it like a show, not like a sincere approach. They're simply empty words hoping for the appearance of looking religious. And when we shout out empty words in public, it's almost like we're trying to pretend to be something we aren't. I used the example this morning of me going to McDonald's and standing in the McDonald's parking lot and say, here I am at McDonald's. I'm here every day. I'm hot. I'm smothered with ketchup. I'm a hamburger. Now, after I said that, Keenan said, you really need to find a better example, Mom. <laughs> and I said, well, give me one. He goes, okay, you could have a lot of hair accessories, but you're not a beautician. <laughs> I said, okay. He said, you could have a lot of clothes, but you're not a, a designer. And I said, okay, enough. <laughs> but the idea is the appearance does not make you into that person. Another example of this um, is a theatrical production. If we think of a, that this is a theatrical production we're putting for God, and it's not that. He wants us to be authentic. He doesn't want us just out loud proving our own ability. The second issue that is wrong and that we can do wrong in prayer is there are wrong words to pray. The heathens used vain repetition. And they used them as spells. It was almost as if they felt like if they could memorize something and continue this mantra over and over, people would ooh and ah. 
They're so intelligent. Look at how much they can memorize. And they can continue to say it without stumbling or having any problem with their words. And my, aren't they religious? Aren't they righteous? But the problem with vain repetition is it's actually very phony. I thought of the fact that I, I've played piano for years. I could come in here and have memorized an incredible piece of music and come to this keyboard and play it and you guys would ooh and ah, Shalane is really good at the piano. I can't believe Ronnie doesn't put her on the worship team. <laughs> and the problem with that is that after I've played that same piece of music over and over again, at every function, at every family gathering, for every guest who comes to my home, and then I sit down here and someone takes a piece of music off the music stand and says, here, play this, and I go, oh, well, I don't really do chords well. Oh, well, I don't really play by ear. Oh, well, I can't invert anything. Um, what really is, is found out here is I am not a musician. I'm a memorizer. I'm not a performer. I'm a phony. And that's what happens with vain repetition. And that's why Jesus says, don't do that. Because actually the words become very empty and meaningless. Another example of vain re repetition would be if in your life, if your spouse, your children, a friend a co-worker, your boss, whomever, always use the exact same greeting or information with you when they saw you. Good morning, Shalane. You sure look nice today, Shalane. Have a nice day today, Shalane. Be kind to people around you, Shalane. Watch your words today to Shalane. Be sure you get your work done today, Shalane. Have a nice day, Shalane. Goodbye. Then pretty soon, as that person is mouthing those words to me, I'm mimicking them back. I know what's coming. And I recognize that there is no care, no concern, no compassion or relationship in those words that are spoken or in the person who's speaking them to me. And we have the potential of falling into that same trap when we use vain repetition in prayer. Because then our words become robotic. That is vain repetition. The other issue that we have to really guard against in prayer is that we use the wrong motive. Many times we use the wrong motive. Mom, I want this. Dad, I want that. Give me this. Give me that. Do this for me. Do that for me. Move that thing out of my way. Remove that person from my situation. Get this for me. Get that for me. Go there for me. Come here for me. If our motive in prayer is all about me, about serving me, saving me, doing something for me, then our motive in prayer is wrong. And we have to watch that because so many times our prayers to God sound like a long list of our wishes, our demands, and our desires. And it's no surprise to me that God isn't interested in that kind of prayer for me because I don't respond to relationships like that very well either. I don't hang around with very many people who just ask and ask and ask and demand and demand of me. So why would I expect God to enjoy that kind of relationship back? And we have to really watch that. Because what happens in those kind of relationships is we end up moving away from those people because we recognize they are one-sided and selfish and that those kind of motives are not what we want to have in our relationship. So we move away. And unfortunately, this can happen in our prayer life as well, where our motive is like that and we move away from God. And even if it's not our motive, but it is our method, it's still wrong. So we really have to guard against that. We have to see prayer as a two-way conversation and not just a shopping list of our requests. And now that we have seen these things that prayer is not, and what we're supposed to turn away from, let's move on to point number two, where we learn about developing a powerful, productive prayer life. And point number two is that we follow the Lord's model. We follow the Lord's model. If we wanted to become really good at golf, and we had the resources, we'd seek out Tiger Woods, or Phil Mickelson now, since he's on the top of the game. 
If we wanted to become a great musician, we could seek out someone here because this worship team is filled with talent. If we wanted to become a great basketball player, we could seek out Michael Jordan. And because we know that what they do gets results, we'd go there. And because we know that the way Jesus prayed got results, we go there. We go to him and to what his model is. And he modeled an incredible way for us to learn to pray. Something that's great about God's word, and we see this all throughout scripture, we can open the Bible and we can read it and we can understand it for, for what it's right there printed in front of us about. But we also find that with the simple word that he has printed, if we dig deeper, we find buried, layered and layered, deeper and deeper, more and more truth, more and more about him, as he reveals more and more to us. And the Lord's prayer is just like that. It's this simple prayer that's only a couple verses long. And yet within this simple prayer is an incredible amount of detail and information about God's desire for relationship with us, how he wants to meet our needs, how he wants to save us from temptation, what he has planned for the end for all of us. And there's so much in this little simple prayer. It reminds me a lot of the story um, of Jesus when he was preaching and there was a group of 5,000 people who needed to be fed. And what was it that fed them? This little simple boy's lunch. A little simple lunch. Five loaves of bread, two fish. And yet that little simple lunch was enough to feed more than 5,000 people. And at the end of the feeding, there were leftovers more than they even started out with. God's word is like that. The Lord's prayer is like that. We're going to read through this prayer, and it's a simple little prayer, and yet it has so much. And we're going to spend a few weeks on this, and even at the end of this, there's going to be leftovers, things that we didn't even get to that you can find on your own as well. And I'm excited to go there. Now, the, one of the things that we have that's a problem with the Lord's prayer that we have to remember is in verse number 9. In this manner, therefore pray. In this manner, we have to remember that the Lord's Prayer is a model. It's not a formula or a superstition, but it's a model of prayer. The problem when we don't remember this, when we treat it like a formula, or we treat it like some special magical mantra prayer, is that it has the potential of becoming a vain repetition. And we've already seen what happens with that. If we treat it like a spell that the more we repeat it, the better our chances are of having our prayer answered, we're treating it completely incorrectly. Jesus teaches us to be persistent in our prayer life, not repetitive in our prayer life. He wants us to mean what we say. And that's why he provides a model for us so that we can actually think about it and, and learn how to pray through it. The problem that if we treat this as a magic formula or use it as a repetitive prayer is that then it becomes so familiar that it's just words and we allow ourselves, our minds to wander as we're going through it. As a quick exercise, just to, to kind of show you what I mean here, I'd like you to answer a couple of questions and please answer them out loud. They're all very simple. If you plant an acorn... It grows into a tree that is called an... Very good. If a house is on fire, there's gray stuff that comes out of the top, and that is called... The sound that a frog makes is a... Very good. The white of an egg is a... The white of an egg is an egg white. <laughs> it's not a yolk. But you see how easy it is just to start saying words, thinking they even have meaning, but they don't. And that's what we have to avoid. That's how we look at this as a model. Now, I don't want you to get me wrong. There is so much comfort in having this prayer memorized. And it's wonderful to have scripture memorized. And to be able to fall back on this prayer and use it to bring you comfort is exactly right. And I encourage you to do that. But to utilize this prayer as your standard prayer or your staple in your prayer life is misusing this prayer. Because Jesus said, in this manner, 
I want you to pray. It's a model. It's an outline that I want you to, to, to understand. What we're going to do next is go through this prayer out loud together. On the back of, of the sermon notes is a copy of the prayer. And we also have it up on the screens. And I'd like you to say it out loud together. And remember, think about the words that we are saying. Remember, this is a prayer. Don't use this as whatever you memorized when you were five or six or ten years old. But it's a prayer, and let's pray it together. And we'll be starting together. Um, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good reading. Now turn to somebody next to you and say, you did a really good job praying. You should do that more often. Very good. The model that we're going to see outlined for us through the Lord's Prayer is a model that has some basic components to prayer in them. And on the back of this handout, we've also listed those. The components in this prayer are adoration and submission, petition, repentance, and praise. And these are the outline forms from which you can be praying. There's another outline that we included back here, which is called ACTS. It's an acronym, A-C-T-S. Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. We've listed them both because I want you to see this is what a model is. And that's what the Lord's Prayer, when he's saying in this man manner, is modeling. And just so that you know, supplication, think of the word supply. The things, the requests that we have for ourselves and for others. But as we go through this, we're going to see exactly what he meant in, in this manner. That it's a model, that it's an outline. And what we're going to do next now, seeing that it's a model, seeing that it's an outline, is start moving towards through this outline. And the first three things that I'm going to be teaching on are the who, the where, and the what of this prayer. Point number three on your outline is to recognize to whom we are praying. Recognize to whom we are praying. The first two words of this prayer are our Father. And there's no mistaking any word that shows up in this prayer. I want you to know it's by divine appointment. Jesus taught us to pray our Father on purpose. Our, not mine. Because he wants us to recognize ourselves as not independent and not selfish in our prayer life, but actually part of a large corporate brotherhood who are known by one thing, that we are all sons and daughters of God. That there is one God and that we are all his sons and daughters. That when we end up in heaven, Republicans, Democrats, and independents will not be noted. It will not be noted what our hobbies and our interests are. We won't hang out with people based on the opinions that we had about certain issues. And our race and our nationality will not even matter. The one thing that will tie us all together is the fact that we are all sons and daughters of God. And he recognizes that if we don't buy into that here, we're going to have a trouble, a difficult time with it there. And so we buy into it right now when he says, our Father. It removes all selfishness from us so that we can open up our prayer life to include not only what we need, but what our brotherhood needs and wants and what God wants for all of us. The second part of this is the fact that he used Father. The word Abba. You know, it's really great about this word Abba. I had a, a girlfriend when Tad and I first got married, um, a couple that was in our small group, and she was a speech pathologist, and she said, do you know what the very first word, the sound that a child can make is? Ba. And how great it is that when you put ba, ba, ba together, this little baby sound, ba, 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 added together is abba, 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 abba. And that the very first utterance out of a child is a cry out to his father. That's no mistake. And it's no mistake that Jesus says, 
reach out to him in prayer as your father. He wants that relationship to be paramount to us. He wants us to recognize him as dad when we're praying and that we're that familiar and comfortable to approach him. There's no mistake that that was it. It shows the reality of his character, his love for us. And throughout scripture, we see that names that are used have significance. All through the Old Testament, when there were names, and I think of it when Leah was naming her sons, Reuben was named because of this, and Levi was named because of that, and Simeon was named because of this, and Judah, because I will praise the Lord, was named because of that. My parents named me Shalane because she has plenty words. And there's always, there's always meaning in our names. Besides significance, names also show relationship. All through the Old Testament, we see titles for God, the Almighty, which shows His power, the Sovereign One, the Most High, which illustrates His supremacy. Jehovah shows His Lordship. And in the New Testament, this is the first time we call Him Father, the One who loves us like a dad. Now, we see images all through the scripture of him, him being referred to as the father of many nations, the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We see him being referred to as the father, but this is the first time the relationship is actually asked that we were not refer to him, but talk to him as father. It's not a reference, but rather a relationship now, and this is the first time that this is taught to us. We don't talk about him. We talk to him as father. For all of you fathers out there, you know there are few people on this earth who you give the privilege and honor of calling you dad. Us moms the same way. And you know that whenever you hear that word, dad, your heart just stops. Even if it's just a phone call. Dad? And you it's my boy. And mom, we think the same thing. That gets our attention. And how great that that's exactly the title and the relationship that God wants us to go to him with in prayer. That we can cry out, oh, dad, father. Jesus spoke to him that way. And he wants us to address him that way as well. Which means that when we start feeling inadequate about prayer, Boy, when we say things like, oh, I don't know how to say this, or I'm not good enough to go to God with this, or I don't know how to pray. I've never been taught that. It's not going to go very well. It's not going to sound very good. Then when we have those thoughts, we accept them only that they are from Satan and reject them. Because our Father wants us to come to Him. And just as parents ourselves or for those of you who have gone to your parents, we don't care if they have their words put together just right. We don't care if they can't do it in an allotted amount of time, or if our children can't communicate with the right vocabulary or vernacular. It doesn't matter. It's the relationship. It's the fact that our kids come to us that is important. And it's exactly the same issue with God. He just desires that we have that relationship with him and that we come to him. He is a loving father who every time he hears us say, Dad, he gets our attention. As parents, we know it doesn't matter if it's in a mall or in our house or here at church or in a shopping center. Whenever we hear, Mom, Dad, it gets our attention. And we start looking around and all of us start looking to see whose child it was that did just tip over that thing over there. It gets our attention when we hear that. My final word to you about the fact that it's our Father and to whom we are to pray is that we are not to pray to saints or angels. And why? First of all, because our model prayer was to our Father. That's who Jesus prayed to, and that's to whom we will pray. But the second thing is, is that saints and angels have neither the power nor the possession 
to grant us what we request. It doesn't belong to them. So we waste our time when we go to anyone except for our Father. That's who Jesus prayed to. That's who we go to. And remembering when you are praying, you're having a conversation with your Father. The fourth point here is understand where God is located. In heaven. Where God is located. The question I have about this is how far away is heaven? Is heaven to the moon? Is heaven to Mac? Is, we say certainly not, right? Is, is heaven to Cleveland? The problem is when we start putting some kind of a distance um, positioning on heaven. We see God as being farther and farther away from us and harder and harder to access. And that's one of the things that happens in our prayer life. So we say, you know, he's really so far away. I mean, for heaven's sakes, he's way up there and we can't even access him. And when I start thinking about some of the things that we say about approaching God, like times when we say, oh God, as I come into your presence, or Lord, as I approach your dwelling place, I can imagine God saying, where do you think you've been? Because Jesus said, lo, I am with you always. And so we tend to make heaven seem like this some distance pla- distant place, and Jesus says, I'm with you always. So I started looking up, where heaven is and what heaven is. The Greek word for heaven is Uranos, U-R-A-N-O-S. It's where we get the planet Uranus from, the name for the planet Uranus. In this prayer, it's actually in the plural form, which means that the prayer would actually say something like this. Our Father, the one in the heavens, and then when you, I looked in the New Testament and found out what it said about the heavens, the heavens was used to describe the atmosphere, the air that we breathe, the sky that we look at, for what's right around us. It's that close. It's right here. It's like it came out of the palm of your hand. Like when you say, that appeared out of thin air. That is what I found. And I sense that what Jesus is trying to get us to capture is that we would say, our Father, the one who's right here, who's this close, who's never away from me, you're right here, abiding with me, standing by my side and all around me and with me, always. And what peace and comfort that brings to a prayer life when you don't feel like you're trying to access somebody who you have to scream to get to. He's right here. And that brings such comfort to know that he's always right here with us always. And with that truth, we know the who, and we know the where, and now the what. And number five is to grasp what it means to hallow God's name. To hallow God's name. Now, I put the word hallow right up there on that list of difficult Christian words. It's listed with sanctified, sacrament, consecrated, begat, all those words that we read and go, oh, why don't you just use the word you mean? Why don't you just say Joseph had this many sons instead of all the begatting thing? When I run into one of those difficult words, I turn to a a neat translation of, of Scripture that I have found by Eugene Peterson, and it's called The Message. And so I opened up The Message to study about this, and in The Message, Eugene Peterson wrote this. Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Reveal who you are. And I thought, oh God, that you would reveal who you are and that I would reveal who you are. How wonderful to look at what he's really saying here is that his nature would be known. And what is God's nature? He is holy He is just. He is graceful and forgiving. He is peaceful and compassionate and loving. And what he is saying here is that if we could adapt that nature into our lives, we would be hallowing God's name. It would be as if we said, the things that I say 
are things Jesus would say. The things that I do are the things Jesus would do. And by doing that, I am hallowing God's name. I am reflecting His nature. I think it's really important that we note that one of the very first components of this prayer is not that His laws are kept or His rules are followed, but that His nature is revealed and that we have a part of that. We are the reflection of God's character. And it's rather amazing that God has allowed the holiness of his nature on this earth to be bound up in our character and our conduct. And that is a huge and awesome responsibility. One of the first parts of this prayer is a reminder to us, reflect God's character in your life. It's as if we are saying, God, I want you to be able to sign your name on my day. That at the end of my day, you can write a big G-O-D on the day and say, yep, she lived that day for me. She hallowed my name. And too many times we let other things sign their names to our day. We let our jobs and our ambitions and our desires and our addictions and our habits and bitterness and discord, and unforgiveness, and hatred, and gossip, and even good things, like our hobbies and our interests, sign their names to our day. And when we let that happen, we are not hallowing God's name. And it's important that we remember that when the name of God is hallowed or blasphemed, God is either glorified or disgraced by us. We are to show his nature. We are to hallow his name. And the way that we do that is that we would pray to be like him and that we would start living a life that he would sign his name to, that we would hallow his name. We can start doing all of this by when we pray, that we pray through this model like this. Oh, Father, our Dad, We're so blessed to be your children. We're so blessed to have this relationship with you. And I'm so glad you're right here, right now, all the time. Even when I don't feel you, there's a reality that you are right here because you promised that. Today, may I live a life that brings glory to you. May the people around me see you because I hallow what you are in what I say and what I do. That's how to use the beginning of this prayer like a model. That you're just using the components and starting to go through it. And this is the first step of this powerful journey that we're going to go on together to improve our prayer life and make it productive and bring results. I'd like to ask the worship team to come back up. And as they're coming back up, I just want to encourage each one of you This is such a great opportunity to really become a person who prays and and that these prayers actually produce results. And that's what we want. We want a great new relationship with our Father. We want results in our prayer life. And this series is actually going to teach us to move along that way. Will you stand with me? For some people here, this might be the very first time you've ever heard any kind of teaching on prayer. And your prayer this morning might be, okay, God, I'm ready. I am going to really try to start praying to you as my father. I'm really going to get a prayer life going. For some of you, it might be, I know some of this, but you know, I have just, I have stumbled in my prayer life. But as we learn together, as a congregation over, and a group of people over the next few weeks about how to really have productive prayer life, Let's join together and do it. No matter where you are, let's increase the productivity of our prayer life. I'd like you to bow your heads with me and no raising hands. We're just going to, as Jesus said, go into our quiet room because our Father who will see us. And I would like you to quietly just pray with me. Father, thank you for being right here for showing us that we need to reveal who you are 
in our lives so that we can bring honor to you and so that others will see who you are. And we ask that you would just be with us during these weeks as we learn from Jesus, the most incredible prayer warrior and teacher out there, how to have a great prayer life, one that brings results, one that, that turns us into people who really hear you and really see you working in our lives. I want to be part of that, God. I want to have that relationship with you. Open myself up to you for that purpose so I can glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. We believe strongly in the power of prayer here. If there's anyone here who would like to have prayer for anything going on in your life, I'd like to invite you. You can come down forward here. We have a ministry team who would love to come and pray with you. If you're more comfortable to come to our prayer room, please go to our prayer room. But don't miss an opportunity just to converse with the Creator. And as we worship together, enjoy this time with Him.